This is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FY Investment Group and your host of Washington Current Review, where we interview leading voices from business, from politics, that impact you, the viewer. Today, our guest is Adil Baloj. Adil, nice to see you, nice to meet you. Thank you. And welcome much. to our show. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Correct. You see, you sure did. Thank okay. you. Okay. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Who are you, where you come from, and what you do? Um, before I introduce myself, just want, would like to make one quick comment. Uh, I should be on that side, and you should be on this side. You're you're a great inspiration. Uh, well, well, there's hey. people people know you. You don't know the you don't know them. So uh, uh, so just wanted to make that comment. Well, it's an I honor. Do, I do want to thank you I, very much. It's an much. honor uh, to be here. If I can uh, inspire people to do well, but to do good, that will be the biggest legacy that I'll leave behind. Thank you very much, and that's that's pretty much the point I'm trying to make. Um, uh, as you mentioned, my name is Adil Baloch. I, I'm a uh, CPA certified public accountant. Uh, I'm also a certified tax resolution specialist. I have a small practice in Montgomery Village, uh, Montgomery County, Maryland. So you are from Maryland? I am from Maryland, yes. Oh. <laughs> um, um, I have been. You lived in, there in Montgomery County also? I have lived in Montgomery County since 1994. Yeah. So, so where do you live in Montgomery County? I live in Clarksburg now. Yeah. But I have gone from, uh, I tend to move north. So I moved from, uh, in 1994, being in uh, Gaithersburg area um, over the course of uh, 24, 25 years. Mm -hmm. I have moved about 15 miles north. I'm in Clarksburg now. That's a little bit rural and also a lot of uh, open space. Correct. That's right. So And I, I'm, I'm sure you and your family enjoy it. So, okay. Uh, so you had a humble beginning. I had a uh, humble beginning. I... Uh, uh, I actually, my forefathers uh, come from a, a very small, tiny village uh, in, uh, in District Thar Parker in, in the province of Sindh in Pakistan. Uh, my village still does not have access to potable water. Uh, there's no trains that go there. So, um, so how do you get there? Um, there's there's buses. There's World War World War Two actually. What about the road? You can take a car. The, the, yeah, you can actually drive. You can drive okay. drive in a car. Okay. Okay. Uh, the the um, once you go past my village actually, which gets very close to the Indian border, about forty five kilometers. So close to Rajasthan. Close to Rajasthan. Yes. So this is desert that I'm talking. Thar Parker is a desert, and we are literally forty five kilometers from the uh, from the Indian border. And if you want to go any farther than my village, you will actually have to ride on one of those 1945 uh, World War II trucks, the, you know, the, uh, the high, uh, what do you call those, the high lux or whatever. I got uh, you can actually tell just by looking at them that they were built in 1945 and they're wow. still in service. You actually climb on those and they take So you, you had a humble beginning and humble roots. I hope you helped the people who helped you to get here. Absolutely. We have been in constant touch. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that my father, who I lost in 2006, uh, uh, my father actually came from that background, two master's degrees and a PhD. He was a research scientist. He was a plant pathologist. Uh, he has a few varieties of rice named after him. Uh, he was a scientist at the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines for a while as well. So my father made probably the first inspiration for me um, to do what he did, follow his footsteps. So it's still in you, uh, the passion and the commitment and the love. Correct, that's of right. Of your community. Yeah, yeah. My, I have a picture of my father in my yeah. office that I well, look at I, every day. I also <laughs> there you go, embody so. my parents' dream. Sure. So, uh, so that's a good background. So you went to school over here, then you became a CPA. Correct. When did you start your private practice? I actually started... Uh, Working for myself, I did. Uh, I did a few large independent contracts with sure. Be with Bearing Point, uh, yeah. Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, um, before um, going on my own in 2000, late 2003, early 2004 is when mm -hmm. I started. So, and then I've been in practice uh, ever since. I want to. You you mentioned something about the tax relief. So explain to me what this tax relief uh, act of 2015 is. What's its purpose is for the uh, and so people would know what that. Sure. Is so all there about. was a there was a, a a a good number of tax provisions that were that were going to expire at the end of 2015 or had already expired before December 2000 uh, December 31st 2015, based on the 2000 um, relief extension. Um, all of them were extended. They all have been extended through the end of 2016. So there's still some more work that will need to be done. 
this being election year, I'm not sure what will happen before December 31st. This is the federal tax. So this is fe federal taxation that we're talking about. Obviously, some of the provisions do affect the, the state filings as well, uh, because what shows up on your federal return in some ca in most cases flows through to your state as well. So it does affect eventually your state taxes as well. So a, a few, few, uh, quite a few provisions were actually extended uh, into and, 2016. And, and, and is, uh, what provision were extended for individual as well as for the business? So basically what we're talking about here is, is that uh, elementary um, school teachers, um, as you probably know uh, in this country, if they have to do some activities for the, ch for the, for the children in, 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 in their classes and they end up buying something for, for the kids, um, there was a uh, deduction available. Um, granted, the amount is not that much, but there was a deduction available which was going to expire December 31st. It has been extended. Um, and how much they can deduct? It's $250, but that's good enough uh, for teachers to afford um, an inventory of crayons and, um, um, and, 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 you know, color books and those kind of things. So it covers them for the most part. Most people that I work with, they pretty much get all their money back. So that's, it's, it's a good provision to have. Uh, I'm a strong proponent of getting it, making it permanent, if at all possible, uh, because that not only gives the money back to the teacher, they really do not have to worry about where the money is going to come from if they have something creative or something that will help uh, the development of, of certain children in their classes. So that's one example. What the other examples are for the Tax Relief Act for the so, individuals as well as for business? So, so for example, uh, for um, if the employer provided mass transit, um, a, a bus pass, uh, a train pass, those things were actually uh, used to be taxable, mm -hmm. but then they went to be non-taxable and they were going to expire at the end of uh, so that December. Had been extended that as well. had been ex extended as well. Now it actually also includes, not only it was extended, but it has been expanded as well. It also includes the bike sharing program now. So if employer provides bike sharing to their uh, employer provides bike sharing to their employees, that actually has been extended. You, you asked about business, uh, the, uh, the employment credit. If you hire somebody who has been out of the working force for a long time, uh, provided they qualify, you actually get credit for certain taxes that you pay on their behalf. That was going to expire at the end of uh, 2015. That has been extended. So there's some really good provisions that has been extended. Um, again, everybody has their own opinion. In my, in my opinion, there's a f quite a few provisions uh, in the extensions that I think should be made permanent because they help the such taxpayer. As, such as? Uh, this uh, long-term uh, employment credit. Yeah. It's a very good credit that generates employment. Uh, it actually encourages employers to find people who have been out of the working force for a very long time, bring them back, get them, get them going again. Um, you are able to find more deserving people uh, because just by the nature of it, if they have been looking for too long and they have not been able to find the opportunity that they were looking for, um, they probably have given up. But with this provision, the employer can do their due diligence or maybe go a little deeper in their search, uh, maybe go to the county office and find out uh, the unemployment records and those kind of things and, and, and go a step further because there's something in it for both sides, the employee and the employer. So you want to see that permanent? I would like to see that permanent, correct. And how much you can deduct? Uh, it's two thousand dollars potentially up to two thousand dollars. Which isn't bad. Not bad at all. Absolutely not. Individual as well as the business. Uh, so the business takes the credit for okay. the Okay. Individual. So, do individual not take. gets the paycheck, <laughs> and the employer gets the credit for the taxes, the certain taxes that they pay on their behalf. Uh, any provision that have been extended for the tax preparers? Uh, in terms of the... Uh... Uh, it's actually probably a good thing for the viewers to know. Um, I, even though the tax, the ta your tax return is your responsibility at the end of the day, there has been some provisions that not too many people are aware of that have been put, put in place that are related directly to the tax preparer. There were some soft picks on the tax returns, meaning they found something wrong, they did some investigation, and after the investigation they found out that the tax preparer, not the taxpayer, was responsible, and then the tax preparer was penalized. Now there are some hard picks on the tax return, meaning previously, before, uh, before these tax provisions, the only thing that was taken into account was the earned income credit. The tax preparer was responsible for doing the due diligence on earned income credit. 
that has now been extended. That actually encompasses not only the earned income credit, it also encompasses the child tax credit. Mm. It also encompasses the education credit. So the preparer, being the expert or the, or the, or the knowledge um, the person that they are, or the knowledgeable person that they are, they have to ask the right questions and they have to actually fill out these actual forms before they submit the tax return for, for, the, pay, for the taxpayer. And if something co does not come out right on those tax returns, it's pretty much a given that the tax preparer will be held responsible. Now, on, on, in addition to that, the penalties that were in place for the tax preparers, so $5,000 or 50% of their fee that they got for, for preparing the tax return. So the, um, the $5,000 still stays in place. What has extended or, or, or has been expanded is the penalty has gone uh, from being 50% of their fee to 75% of their fee. Oh, okay. So it is a significant penalty. People who are actually the filers, the taxpayers, they probably should take it seriously because it's, it's, it's the responsibility on both parts. Yeah, the tax preparer gets penalized, but now the tax, tax return will probably get amended as well, and the taxpayer will be held responsible at the end of the day for the tax return itself. So it becomes a teamwork at that point, and the taxpayer should provide the information that is required to the tax preparer and understand that they, they are under scrutiny as well, and they, have, they can only do as good a job as the information that you would provide them. So what's the tax identification number? What is that? Is the social security number is it it's, different? It's different. So social security number tax is, identification number is the same that you get for the business. So that's the federal identification. The federal so identification. FEIN. Is, and so, so what is this thing individual so tax identification? Individual tax identification number I ten are the numbers that are given to let's say for example, um, my parents came to visit me in nineteen ninety five the first sure. time and my father wanted to open a bank account. Uh, and we wanted to get uh, health insurance for him as a tourist while, while he was here. So we opened the bank account and to open the bank account, we applied for a tax ID number so he can use that to open a bank account. Sure. Now, he could not work under that number because it's not a social security number. Social security number, as you know, is only for citizens and the permanent residents. A person who is here either to do business uh, or here on a, on a, um, on a temporary visit they get the tax ID number and they use the tax ID number for purposes like perhaps applying for a driver's license, opening a bank account, buying a uh, uh, transit insurance and those kind of things. So that's so it's quite different from... Uh, so you have to apply it in order for you to get it? Correct. So you provide them documentation, copy of your visa, copy of your travel documents, all your information, your address and everything, and then they assign you a tax ID number that you use. What has changed uh, related to those tax ID numbers, I believe, uh, everyone who was issued a tax ID number, an I-10 before 2013, they will have to get it renewed, I believe, between 2017 and 2020. That's, those, are the, those are the years when they will need to be renewed. So far, what was issued was issued. Now they have to go back and reapply and revamp the whole thing. It's part of the bigger initiative related to the identity theft that has been, been has becoming a significant problem right now. So, there has been a lot of changes for the uh, additional due diligence requirements. Correct. Tell me Correct. a little bit about that. So, due diligence, as we were talking about the penalty, so it pretty much goes hand in hand. Um, tax preparer, in some cases, like you, uh, like myself, yes. In cases where the government is actually forking out the money to pay to people, money that they did not earn, but they're getting it back because they qualify for earned income credit, they qualify for additional child tax credit, those kind of things. If there's a refundable credit coming back to you from the government, the government now considers the tax preparer as the cop on the street. You actually look at everything, you actually ask all the right questions, now you are responsible that you have done the due diligence and this person actually qualifies for the earned income credit or the education credit or the additional child tax credit. I have looked at all the records. This is the criteria that I followed and this person actually qualifies based on that criteria. Now you can submit the tax return. As I said, if something wrong comes out, the tax preparer is responsible. And that's the provision that is in effect now. And the responsibility is uh, to the taxpayer. So if something goes wrong, something happens, and what are the penalty? So the tax preparer, uh, the, the, pay, the, the tax uh, payer obviously will pay the usual accuracy related penalties and the interest and, 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 uh, and, and underpayment penalties and so on and so forth. Uh, 
tax preparer, on the other hand, is subject to the penalties that we that we discussed earlier. So they both end up paying something. They both have to pay some kind of penalties. The tax uh, pre preparer is paying the uh, five thousand dollars or the seventy five percent of their fee that they earn from that preparation uh, engagement. They pay that plus the taxpayer will pay the interest rate is at six percent right now per year it's five percent uh, uh, per month uh, uh, half a percent per month um, and the penalties they could be as high as twenty percent of your overall My tax level yes it's 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 pretty significant but you still want to do the uh, I, I, I love I, I love I what I do and I, I try to be as careful as possible <laughs> that's that's the best I can do what kind of form do you think the IRS, ne IRS needs to do to do the, the, I'm sorry, you said that again? What kind of reforms? Oh, the reform. The, Actually, the, the, that, you know, that's a very good question because reform, the IRS reforms, that's is what part, of this, uh, part of this extension. Uh, so the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, and I think on, 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 on my program, uh, on tax, uh, the, the Capital Forum, I have mentioned Taxpayer Bill of Rights probably 25 times already. People need to know that there's such a thing called Taxpayer Bill of Rights. They have the right to privacy. They have the right to accurate tax bill. They have the right to respect. They have the right to service because uh, IRS is a service-based organization. Uh, they have the right um, to not pay a penny more than what is, uh, what is assessed well, against them. Yeah. All those things are actually part of this, this bill where the IRS has committed to provide training to their employees to train them on these things that this is part of the law now and this is what the taxpayer actually deserves and this is their right and this is how they should be treated and that's what they should be getting from the IRS. It, has it been passed in the Congress? It has, yes. So it, uh, as I said, this has been passed temporarily. It has only been extended to 2016 December. Uh, something will need to be done prior to that. Uh, there was a talk of, uh, of making, it, uh, uh, making it permanent, but uh, no, now the bill itself covers from 2015 to 2025. Uh, there's about $97 billion at stake here, mm -hmm. uh, which are only $10 billion of that that is paid for. Um, it, this is a pay-as-you-go bill. Um, it's at the, the entire feedback is at the macroeconomic level, so it's, it is tied to the interest in the future. It is tied to the national uh, 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 gross production. It's, it's tied to all those things. So to pay it back, to, to, to actually recoup the money that you will be spending on this bill, there's still a whole lot of work that, that needs to be done. And that is why this bill actually, this is not the first time this was extended for, uh, for 12 months. It has been extended for 12 months multiple times. It has yet to be made permanent. Uh, some of the provisions that are related to business, especially, uh, meaning the depreciation and the, uh, and the accelerated depreciation and bonus depreciations, those things, again, in my opinion, should always be permanent. Those are some, some really good incentives for businesses uh, and so on and so forth. But to answer your question, it has been passed, but it has only been passed as a patch. It's temporary. Some, some work still needs to be done to make it permanent. So what's the truncated social security number is, and that's a, that is a part of the law now. What's sure. the truncated? I mean, so, I'm we all have a social security uh, number. Yeah, correct. So Without that, you cannot file an individual tax return. You cannot, no. You have to so have a social security. So what's the truncated? Uh, good question. But now truncated, it actually came um, after all these identity theft cases. Just two, three days ago, IRS came back to us and it said, because when you file a tax return, the, every, tax, uh, every taxpayer has a five-digit pin, pin number that, yes. uh, that goes out with it. In certain cases, when people have been an ID theft victim in the past, IRS provides them a six-digit special pin number. Okay. The database that actually had those six-digit pin numbers stored in it, that database got hacked a couple of weeks ago. So that has been suspended temporarily until they revamp it and, and get, get started with that. So the truncated social security number is part of that effort to actually avoid, uh, going forward, avoid uh, uh, ID theft issues. So what it is is that instead of putting your social security number on the 1099s and W-2s, employers are required to actually put um, a, an ID that actually is tied to your social security number. Oh, so it's not your social security number. It might be a one, two, three, four, five number, but in essence, your last name and a combination of that number will point to the social security number in the IRS database. 
And that obviously, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people. It's a big, it's a big undertaking. It's going to cost so a lot of money. So why is it called tourniqueted? Um, so you probably already see it on, on some W-2s. What happens is, is that you will see social security number being uh, nine digit. Yeah, so you they basically see, ask you the last four digits. Last four, and then you put the axes I and everything. You. Now here's the thing, the truncated, um, one of the phishing scams that one of the uh, one of the uh, line items that IRS uh, uh, um, communicates as a possible phishing scam item is is that when somebody calls you uh, acting as an IRS agent, in some cases they might even know the last four digits of your social security number. So the truncated part, and I don't know if that's what it means here. Truncated part was yes, it was last four digits of the social security number, but now last four digits of the social security number being part of the phishing scam as is, even that part might go away eventually and we'll just go back to just an ID that is tied to your social security number and that's all. The time that we have left, which is not that much, talks about the energy efficiency tax credit and the electric uh, vehicle tax relief. So basically anything that is energy efficient, a business um, building an energy efficient uh, uh, office. Uh, uh, getting a solar. Getting, getting a, a solar thermal, panel, getting thermal, getting uh, How much you can deduct? Um, uh, depends. Okay. <laughs> it's a percentage of the amount that you will spend. So and it's 30%? 30% uh, uh, upfront, but then you also have uh, credit on a going forward basis okay. if you don't use the, the entire amount in the so first year. So the people year. should be encouraged to use this? Thing. Absolutely, yes. It's a very good uh, credit. As a matter of fact, uh, even the two-wheel electric plug-in vehicles, they, you get credit for those yeah. now. So, so, so that's, it, a, that's a pretty good idea. Absolutely. People should take advantage of that. And thank you very much, Adil. You're welcome. And thank you very much for all you do. And this is Frank Islam wishing you a great week and thank you for watching our show.